Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello. Welcome to New Books and Music, a channel on the New Books Network. My name is Bradley Morgan, and I am joined today by my guest, Annie Zaleski. Annie is a freelance journalist, editor, and critic whose work has appeared in many publications, including Rolling Stone, NPR, and Salon. She is also the author of Duran Duran's Rio, an installment of the 33 and a third music book series. Her latest book is Lady Gaga, Applause, and is published by Palazzo Editions. Annie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So please share with us what your book is about. So my book is a comprehensive biography of Lady Gaga, and um, I call it an illustrated biography because uh, the way the book is designed is that it's very photo heavy. Um, Obviously, Lady Gaga is such a visually um, arresting, uh, flamboyant performer. And so it was very natural to have, you know, a visual um, illustrations of kind of, you know, everything, her music, her fashion, her stage setup, um, as well as information about her life. Um, starting from when she was growing up in New York city, all the way up through, um, her acting, uh, recently and also her latest album, Chromatica. So in just over a decade, Gaga went from obscurity to becoming a cultural icon for an entire generation. And she showcases that talent in a lot of ways. You touched upon that music, film, fashion, and so much more. But before we get into all of that, let's go back to the beginning. Before Lady Gaga, can you tell us about Stephanie Germanata's childhood and those early signs of her talent? Absolutely. You know, it's when you look back at there's so many musicians that you can kind of pinpoint you know, that even when they were very, very little, they had musical talent. And she definitely qualified was that. Um, She started writing music um, when she was in elementary school, basically, on Mickey Mouse staff paper. She went right to the piano in her family's um, house and started kind of banging on it. And she was always very open, too. There was a story that was told that they went out to a restaurant and she was, you know, entertaining guests there. So she was kind of a natural-born performer. And, you know, as she kind of grew up into, um, you know, elementary school and high school, she really nurtured that. She took um, uh, acting lessons. Uh, she played out in some New York City clubs. Her parents had to take her because she was so young. And so she started getting the performing bug as well. So she really, you know, I think was kind of set from her path very, very early on in her life. So you mentioned her parents were a big influence on her, and especially her father, who often played classic rock records from his personal collection. And that really stuck with Stephanie, with even her first song being inspired by the cash register sounds of Pink Floyd's money. But one major influence on her was Bruce Springsteen. And there's a really great story involving Thunder Road I was wondering you could tell us about. Yeah, you know, it's so and you're right about her dad. Her dad grew up in Jersey. And so obviously, if you you have ties to New Jersey, Bruce Springsteen is your guy. And so he basically told her, like, look, if you can learn how to play Thunder Road, I'll get you a piano. And she did. She basically ended up, and I, I don't remember exactly how old she was, but she was pretty young. And he said, you learn how to play this, and I will you know, reward you for that. And so she ended up getting that. So you mentioned that her parents had to take her sometimes to clubs when she was very young to kind of foster that musical talent. And this started coming through in her teenage years and into college when she enrolls in the Tisch School at NYU. How did that craft start to come together? And tell us about those early performances. So when she was at Tisch and then even after, um, like many people, she, she kind of fronted her own band. And, you know, in hindsight, and there's it's funny because there's actually YouTube footage of her still. And you can kind of use the Internet Archive to find her old websites. Um, so she was very, very ambitious even then. And it was kind of like, I don't even know, you know, a little bit bluesy, a little bit rock and roll. You know, it was kind of, you know, it was the early 2000s. So it was kind of like, you know, post Joan Osborne, you know, little bit of classic rock oriented, you know, maybe a little bit jammy, kind of bluesy, um, you know, rock stuff, basically. And so she was the lead singer. And at the time, though, she was not kind of the flamboyant Gaga we know today. You know, she was very kind of dressed pretty normally, you know, kind of like what you would think a college student who was trying to find their way um, would wear. And so, um, yeah, and so she was, and she looked nothing, you know, like how we know now, you know, very kind of plain haircut. And so she looked like, you know, kind of your normal, 
you know, college kid, basically, like you're fronting a band, you know, anywhere, anywhere in the US. And but but she did play out, though. And I think that's a big difference is that she wasn't just playing necessarily on campus, you know, she would play around, she would play in different clubs around New York City as well. And so even then, she had ambitions to, you know, go beyond, you know, her the where she was kind of operating at the time. She had ambitions to be bigger and to have a wider impact. So this is the period where Stephanie develops her persona, Lady Gaga. Where did that name come from? You know, it's funny, um, depending on who you ask, interpretations vary. Um, I think the most common one people you know, cite it as Queen's song, um, Radio Gaga, and that was given to her by a producer. Um, and, you know, and so that's kind of the, the like, the, you know, overarching thing. But, uh, you know, it, it all depends because there's other stories that float around too. But that does seem pretty plausible to me, you know, because I think Radio Gaga is a pretty big song. And, you know, it's it, it just fits her because she was very, you know, into glam rock and kind of flamboyant. So I think that's, it's pretty safe to say. You know, there are a lot of great stories about her early childhood and developing that talent in her career. And one story that really stuck out for me was that her first experience with a record label didn't really go well. Well, you write in your book that it was the most transformative period for Gaga, and this is where her reinvention illustrated her resilience. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think you know, there's, and when you look in music, there are so many stories of artists who had record deals and you later became big stars, but their first record deals didn't pan out. You know, Katy Perry fit that bill, Pink fit that bill, and Gaga was the same. You know, she was basically signed to a label and it didn't work out. They dropped her. And she was devastated, though, because, you know, she was very talented and always really working, working, working. It was really the first, like, big setback she had. So, you know, she she told a story about how, you know, she would basically sit on her fire escape listening to David Bowie and, you know, basically decided, I'm going to reinvent myself. Um, and so she met some some performers who were kind of on the Lower East Side of New York. And at the time, this was like the mid 2000s, more or less, there was a pretty vibrant performance art scene. And so she went all out. She basically ditched any of the, you know, kind of mousy hair and the very demure outfits and said, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And she wore these amazing outfits that were like like a a disco ball bra and and just like skimpy bikini bottoms and do things like set hairspray on fire on stage and just do these completely over the top things with a couple of friends. And it, it kind of did the trick. It kind of got the attention of people. You know, it was like she could not be ignored at that point um, in terms of what she was doing. So let's get into the Gaga that we know and love, and that's the music. Her first album was The Fame that came out in 2008, and the themes of that album explored the complexity of celebrity. Can you share with us how Gaga explored that theme in the music? Yeah, you know, what was so interesting is even, I mean, from the get go, she was really, um, you know, she was really tackling complex things. You know, she wasn't shying away from tackling things that were challenging for people, you know, so she kind of explored the downside of fame. She kind of explored, you know, the the uh, the side of celebrity that maybe would be a little bit, um, you know, I'm trying to think of what to say, um, not damaging exactly, but damaging, you know, like everyone wants to be famous. Everyone wants people to, um, you know, everyone wants to have that kind of that celebrity and everything that comes with it. But when you actually get that, it can be, you know, maybe not necessarily what you think. And so a lot of her, you know, the fame, even the title is a little bit sort of ironic almost, you know, she, she kind of, her persona was, you know, embracing fame, even as she was kind of, you know, showing that everything, you know, maybe isn't what quite as glitzy as it seems, um, you know, talking about things like paparazzi, um, which was on her first record, which is kind of, you know, uh, showing the downside of basically being photographed all the time and in public and what happens when you're, you know, being shadowed all the time and, and things like that. And so, you know, when some other songs were sort of skewering the, the people she, she met at NYU, um, where she was, you know, the very, very rich people who, you know, didn't think anything of, you know, partying and going out and, you know, using their parents' money for things. And so she was almost kind of like a cultural observer as much as she was, um, you know, a songwriter sort of trying to be famous. And so it's really interesting. It's very, very dense and very, um, very rich in terms of interpretation. 
I think that's a very interesting observation because you're right. A lot of people want that fame. We see, you know, the rise of influencers on TikTok and and things. And what really stood out to me in this book was that you explore how she often made a lot of personal sacrifices throughout this period. And that's a huge product of fame is this, you have to be a workaholic who sacrifices a lot. And there was a quote in your book that really stood out to me. And it's, being freed from conventions was the best thing for her creativity. Can you tell us more about that freedom she found through her work as she was making these sacrifices for her art? Yeah, you know, because... You know, it was interesting because music at that time, pop music especially, was in a really interesting place. Um, you know, obviously in the late 90s, early 2000s, teen pop was really big, very kind of Swedish pop. Um, so it was, you know, very, very dominant. And then after, as pop music was kind of coming out of that, they were trying to figure out what's next. And so there was some electronic leaning music. And so it was a little bit more dance music, you know, EDM. And when Gaga came around, it was sort of like people were ready for something that was kind of next. And so they were ready for someone who said, I'm going to be like David Bowie. I'm going to be, and this was when David Bowie was not necessarily releasing records. You know, he was sort of still, had still sort of retired from the spotlight. Um, So he wasn't necessarily as much in the public eye. You know, she was kind of glammy and she was kind of doing some, you know, very guitar heavy stuff. And so she was kind of merging rock and pop, which was very different at the time. Absolutely very different. Um, And the fact that she was kind of doing this meant that, you know, she wasn't trying to conform to what was going on at the time. She wasn't trying to conform to... Um, you know, prevailing trends, you know, even though she did kind of touch on dance music and EDM and was, you know, her music felt contemporary, she didn't feel beholden to it. And so that did make, let her kind of make music that sounded different and really connected with people because it sounded different. Um, And she did work hard at it, you know, and I think that's something else that, you know, when you look at documentaries on her and read it, watch interviews with her, you know, none of this stuff happened overnight, but none of this stuff also happened, um, you know, just by her, you know, not lifting a finger, you know, obviously she had the support of producers and record labels, but she worked extremely, extremely hard to make this happen. You know, you you saw that in her fashion, you saw that in, you know, maybe if she had an instrument on stage, it wouldn't necessarily be be, you know, something regular, it would be, you know, it would be this like contraption that maybe had, you know, that was basically an art project, like a sculpture, it might have, you know, uh, jewels on it, or it might have kind of like stalactites on it. And so she really just went all out to be kind of her Gaga persona, and which is hard work, you know, when you're like, kind of like Bowie did when he sort of, you know, was a, a, a method actor in his different eras. And Gaga definitely took acting lessons. You can tell when she started coming out because she really carried herself, not like Stephanie, but like Lady Gaga. Pushing back against that conformity is something that's always really interested me in Gaga. And a part of the impact of her creativity that's I've always found inspiring is how much of her art as an outsider really resonates with fans. And it's a community that she calls Little Monsters. And Gaga shares a very special relationship with her Little Monsters that you don't see with other fan communities. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think you're right that every every pop star and every, you know, superstar has their fan base. You know, Taylor Swift has the Swifties, Beyonce has the Bayhive, um, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, you know, different fans. BTS says ARMY. But Lady Gaga's little monsters, um, and, you know, it's funny because the word monsters, you know, the connotation is a monster is something terrible and the monster may, might be something horrible. And she really reclaimed that word. You know, if you're feeling like a misfit, if you're feeling like an outsider, if maybe people view you like a monster. She reclaimed that as something positive and saying, you know, she, she dubs herself kind of mother monster and then her fans are little monsters. And it's basically this kind of symbiotic relationship where she's like, you are wonderful and fine just the way you are, no matter, you know, what you want to, you know, how, how you want to carry yourself, how you want to dress, how you want to be, um, you're fine the way you are. And, you know, and so that, and she, from the very start, she was very, she very much operated that way. She's always been a huge ally of pretty much all the, every marginalized community. And people really picked up on that because people can tell she's sincere about it. You know, it's not just a pose to try to, you know, win over fans or, you know, grow her, you know, grow her stature or reputation. She very, very genuinely supports 
and believes in everyone um, who, who are followers. And so it's a really lovely, special relationship, honestly, um, that, you know, that it's very different than a lot of other kind of fan bases, too. So that fan base kind of evolves into an advocacy, and we'll touch upon more of that later, but I want to continue on exploring some more of that earlier music. After her first album, The Fame, she releases an EP called The Fame Monster, which explores these complex celebrity themes, but from a more darker perspective. And this is also a time when she's releasing truly iconic music videos. Bad Romance is my favorite Gaga song and my favorite video, and so I have to talk to the expert who wrote the book on if telling me more about the darker themes in that you know so you i mean you have to start off first with just you're right with the music um you know it, it was so interesting that this came out you know just after the fame because it's like kind of like almost light and dark you know you have a bad romance just in general you're like oh this is not going to be positive but you have things like alejandro and dance in the dark is kind of like um you know kind of a moody electronic dance song telephone is kind of like a bonnie and clyde sort of story and so just even like musically she was already sort of evolving but yeah bad romance is an unbelievable music video um uh, you know i don't even it's like it, it's almost hard to describe it just because it is so uh, you know it is so forward thinking um you you know, she worked with a music director named Francis Lawrence. And it was like, you know, there was, it's, it's very evocative. So all of her, I backing up, all of Gaga's videos are also very intricately choreographed. You know, so along with her music, her videos are so important to her. She's also very, very involved in this. You know, she is also kind of behind the concept. And so basically it's, you know, she gets kidnapped by supermodels and they're, they're basically, it's this long and convoluted plot where she's kind of, you know, drugged and she's sold to Russian mafia. And there's like the, the whole scene is this very bright white sort of, you know, it's meant to be a bathhouse, but it's just very, um, very stark and very disorganized orienting and uh, you know and so she's you know she's basically you know forced to drink and it, it's very it, you know it you could almost do an entire podcast an entire you know kind of dissertation just on this alone because there's so many references to older you know movies and older directors and just in terms of themes of you know selling and how we sell our bodies and how other people want to commodify people and what you need to do to become famous and so it's you know, it's a work of art. And, you know, the fact that this was like her second record and she's already making these really, really elaborate videos also just really spoke to her um, ambition and her ability to make these grand concepts come to life. Because, you know, a lot of musicians have big ideas and they just can't execute them. And she had big ideas and she was like, nope, I'm going to make sure these happen. And they did. It is such an iconic video, and that whole EP has such great videos. You mentioned Telephone, which was a collaboration she did with Beyonce, and that's an, an iconic video that you described as being very Bonnie and Clyde-like, but it contains an inherent social critique that I was wondering if you can tell us more about. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's that happens to be actually my favorite Gaga video, and, uh, you know, you know, there's so many different kind of through lines to that. I mean, you can look at it as, um, you know, there can be a mild critique of, you know, the carceral system in the United States. At the very end, um, you know, basically without without giving too much away when, you know, sort of the culmination of the video is, you know, Beyonce and Gaga sort of basically burning everything down. There's very distinct um, American flag iconography everywhere. And, you know, it's kind of a metaphor for America and the issues America has on you know, so many different levels in terms of crime and just, uh, you know, just in general. And so um, it's it's a really, it's a really striking, and it's based on Quentin Tarantino too, which kind of adds another sort of like layer to it because his movies as well are so, such commentary on violence and, um, you know, and, and, and impression and power and things like that. And so, yeah, it's, it's a really, and you know, and it's one of those videos you watch it. And if you didn't necessarily see the kind of the political critiques, it would work on a certain level, but when you actually really watch it and watch what they're doing, it is extremely striking, you know, in terms of, you know, looking at, uh, you know, the uh, America's role as being oppressors and America's role as being, you know, in power and what that means and, you know, what that means means for marginalized communities. Like it's, that's another one you could do a whole podcast on, you could do a whole dissertation on, honestly. 
you know, I think it's really great you touch upon the American dichotomy element of telephone because for her next album, Born This Way in 2011, you write that it was declarative and defiant and was an extension of the fame monster. But here, in the case of Born This Way, instead of fake monsters, she's addressing the real ones in our everyday lives, which touches upon that American dichotomy element that, you're, that you just discussed. And this album arrived at a very pivotal pivotal time in America. Could you tell us more about it? So Born This Way came out in 2011. And among other things, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was a policy enacted in the 1990s that basically said you could serve in the military and be gay, but you weren't allowed to talk about it, was finally repealed um, after, you know, which was to much rejoicing. Um, But at the same time, Gaga was also a huge advocate, as we talked about, for many marginalized communities, but especially the LGBTQIA plus community. And her lead single, Born in this way specifically called out many of those marginalized communities and said, you are okay the way you are. You know, you are absolutely allowed, you know, I support you. Um, you know, you're born this way, baby. You know, that's, I won't sing it because Gaga sings it better, but it basically became a massive, massive gay anthem because it was basically a call to arms and a, basically a celebration of who people were. And, you know, and that was really the theme of that entire record was very, very much very similar. It's interesting because she kind of weaved religious iconography throughout the songs and kind of used that because, you know, she grew up Catholic and kind of used that to kind of play with the ideas of, um, you know, the self and identity and things like that. And so it was just a really kind of powerful song and kind of just the right place at the right time, because 2011 was really sort of the start of a, of a decade of real, you know, basically, um, you know, activism and advocacy that I think, you know, in 2000, it, it's, it seems so different now in 2023, because we're at such a uh, crossroads, I guess, in terms of, you know, what's going on right now in terms of, in some ways, you know, uh, culture has never been more open. In other ways, there's so many people trying to legislate like trans people out of existence. So it's this very um, terrible tension. Um, but 2011 is kind of really a start where a lot of these things went a lot more mainstream and Gaga was kind of at the forefront of that. I'm really glad you mentioned trans issues because that was going to segue to my next question. Um, <laughs> You know, it's been 12 years since the release of Born This Way, and a really remarkable quality about that album, and I think this speaks to Gaga's resilience and longevity, is just how relevant that messaging of the album continues to be today. And it is, you know, especially when we consider all the recent ways in which the transgender community has been targeted by oppressive legislation that's circulating amongst many state governments. So this seems like a really good place to talk about Gaga's social justice advocacy through her work with the Born This Way Foundation. Could you talk to, with us a l- about that work uh, that she does as a social justice advocate? Yeah, I mean, you know, and that's uh, along with, and I, I will say that this is something that was really important for me to put in the book along with her music, um, just because, you know, she is such an advocate and social justice, um, uh, you know, advocate as well. And so Born This Way Foundation is you know, obviously named after, um, you know, her song. And it's it's basically committed to, you know, supporting young people and empowering them to be kinder. And, you know, and they do that with all sorts of different programs. They do that with all sorts of different kind of initiatives. And, um, I, you know, it basically, you know, she talked a lot about how when she was growing up that she was bullied and how, you know, people were, you know, not very accepting and tolerant of her. And so that that is just kind of kind of baked into this born this way foundation but that's really an offshoot of kind of everything that she kind of you know practices what she preaches in kind of her own music in terms of you know acceptance and tolerance and inclusion and and things like that and so she started with her mom and you know and it's one of those things that she is you know that all these years later is still going really strong which is really exciting as well how did her connection with her little monsters influence this advocacy work You know, I think, you know, people, uh, you know, her little monsters, um, you know, would reach out to her. I think like with a lot of people, you know, as you might have, you know, as a kid, you know, you would write someone fan letters and you would write someone saying, hey, your music meant a lot to me. And so, you know, her fans would reach out to her, you know, on on certain tours, she had people, you know, come up on stage with her and, you know, they would kind of sit together and she would, um, you know, which is not, which, and, you know, kind of talk about things and she would provide comfort to people. And so, you know, I think it also came out of the fact that she saw so many of her followers also, you know, 
being bullied or her followers kind of being um, you know put down for who they are or and and you know and how they live their lives. And so the Born This Way Foundation was also kind of way to be like a space for them to say, hey, I'm gonna you know practice what I preach and you know and make sure that I'm you know trying to get this message out in the world as sort of an extension of my music and my art. And it seems like this advocacy was really starting to influence her art a little bit more directly. Her follow-up album to Born This Way, Art Pop, continued many of the themes from that album. Well, you write that this period was difficult for Gaga and she was rather defensive while promoting the album. You mentioned that she was bullied. And certainly when you become a star and become famous, there's a different kind of level of that. What was going on in her life? You know, so many things. And, you know, I mean, among other things, you know, just on the you know, in, in a perfect world, musicians would be able to just sort of, you know, be able to make their music and not worry about anything. But there's the business side. And so, you know, she was going through kind of splits behind the scenes, like with her manager. And she was also having a really busy schedule. And, you know, kind of both of those things kind of came to a head. And, you know, in, when she was appearing in public, there were some very kind of um, appearances that were very worrisome, you know, I think where, you know, she might looked, she might have looked very put together in the past. And, you know, there were a couple of times where she deliberately made herself look like ugly and made herself look, um, you know, grimy, um, and which, which people were a little bit concerned about. She had a couple of very over the top also like openings that just kind of didn't work. And so it's almost like, you know, her ambition almost got the best of her and which was interesting because it had never happened in the past. You know, she's such a confident performer and someone who knows so much what she wants and what her, and what she wants her music to be. And, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily connecting for the first time. That was difficult. That was very difficult. Um, she also had some other performances that were just not perceived well or not understood. Um, there was one with a performance artist that involved, um, uh, it, it was very gross, but people like throwing up things that was like, that's kind of the performance artist shtick and thing. And it was just, it was not taken in the spirit in which she meant it. And so there was a backlash and you're right that after, you know, when people are so famous and in such good places, you know, uh, it, 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 that can't last forever and people will do something, you know, that people aren't necessarily fond of, or else people will be more critical of an artist and say, oh, you know, we're got to take you down a couple of pegs. And that's what it really felt like um, in art pop. One of the things that she was seemed to be really defensive about on art pop, and I wanted to ask you a little bit specifically about this because it's something that's kind of, you know, troubled me a little bit about her career until this correction was made. But R. Kelly appearing on that album, she uh, he appeared on the song "Do What You Want," and that was later edited out for digital releases. I think in the last two years, and replaced with uh, Christina Aguilera. And some of her responses to that track were very defensive. And I was, and I know that's probably coming from just that, that celebrity stature of just, you've always got people coming at you, but from someone who has written the book and has studied her life and work, what's your perspective on that? You know, it's the R. Kelly question. And cause you're right. There were, you know, she was questioned directly about that at the time because when Art Pop came out, you know, uh, he had the allegations against him were well known. It wasn't anything new. His reputation kind of preceded him. And, you know, it was definitely kind of looked at like, why are you collaborating with him? You know, the, at the time, you know, and this is, uh, she was kind of indicative of how culture was at the time. Culture was really not yet to sort of reckon with what he had been doing and, you know, for lack of a better word, cancel him. You know, he was still getting, he was still touring. He was still kind of getting airplay. You know, there was still a little bit like, oh, your music is so good. And so that's going to, you know, that kind of overshadows, you know, what was going on in your personal life. And that doesn't make it right. And I think you're right that now, you know, she's apologizing and things have been replaced and realized like that's not okay. And that was not okay. Um, and, you know, it just really, it, it shows that as, as, as forward thinking and, um, uh, you know, as much of an ally as Gaga is, she still had missteps and there were still certain areas where, you know, we weren't necessarily had the cultural nuance to think about that yet, or the bravery to say, no, this is not good. I should not have done this at the time. And, you know, and I think part of it is that everything else in her life, you know, it was, that was one of the other thing. you know, that was just one of the things that was going on that was making the whole rollout difficult. 
And so I think that was one of those things where it's like, oh, you know, if that becomes kind of the focal point, you know, maybe if that if that's something like that would make things a lot harder. But it did. You know, I think they filmed a music video for that. It never saw the light of day. Um, so the backlash was pretty swift then, especially because Art Pop did not perform very well. And so I think. Um, you know, the decision was made to sort of, you know, not bury it exactly, but just sort of not not bring attention to it. Um, but, you know, we also don't know, you know, behind the scenes as well, what maybe pressures her label was putting on her. I'm not sure about that. And so, you know, that also kind of shows the music business, the structural um, issues within there in terms of, you know, not you know, looking maybe money over reputation or saying, well, this is better for a career. We need to overlook everything else because the bottom line is more important. And so it, it's really, it is probably one of the ugliest kind of eras and moments in her career. And, you know, she's done what she could to kind of make it better. But yeah, in hindsight, you look back on it, you're like, wow, you know, that's just, it was not handled very well. I don't know, Gaga, but she strikes me as someone who has a lot of self-awareness. And so I think it's very interesting how after Art Pop, she's built up her um, her career as being quite a spectacle at this point, but then she dials it back. She does this album with Tony Bennett called Cheek to Cheek. And I want to know how that came together, you know, specifically, not just from working with someone like a classic figure like Tony Bennett, but the timing seems really interesting to me. And it seems like there's an intentional, like, let's step back before this celebrity thing kind of swallows me whole and explore something about her creativity that perhaps needed that kind of, you know, massaging. I I think you're right in that you know, she released Art Pop, which, you know, just musically, which we, we I didn't touch on, was very much out there. It was, you know, the lead single was Applause, and that was, you know, very kind of typical upbeat Gaga. But there was a lot of really interesting kind of like electro and maybe in some hip hop. And it was definitely sort of um, a, a harder edged album in terms of overall. It wasn't necessarily as commercially accessible. And she did a complete 180 and then released a jazz record with standards record with Tony Bennett. Like it was, you know, when you would think of, you know, exactly what sort of, um, uh, you know, career move someone might make, I think that was probably not on anyone's bingo card. But you're right in that I think that she was trying to, you know, get away from the Gaga persona, you know, cheek to cheek was a little bit more closer to her true self, where she was, you know, it, it's almost like at the time she almost got lost in her Gaga persona a little bit, kind of, you know, it was, you know, she forgot who her kind of her own true self was. And so the the Gaga or the, the Bennett collaboration was, you know, a way for her to sort of embrace, you know, some of because she also grew, listened to that kind of music growing up to kind of remember who she was and kind of get grounded again, but then also show people, you know, she, it's, she sounds amazing on that and just kind of remind people that, you know, I can sing and I can do all these things. Like she's a very gifted interpreter as well as a gifted songwriter and performer. You know, some people tend to look at the great American song book path for an artist and, and think that, oh, they're running out of ideas, but n- not necessarily. She was part of this transitional period. And by the time she comes on the other end of that period, she's a lot stronger as a songwriter. And this is really exemplified in the follow-up album to that, Joanne. It was a very personal album. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about why that album was so personal for her. I mean, I, I absolutely, and this is, I think, when I look at kind of Gaga's discography, this is one of my favorite records by her. Um, so it's named after her late aunt, um, who died before she was even born. But is she was sort of, um, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, kind of exploring, um, you know, I'm trying to think of how you say that here. Um you know, kind of, you know, I guess kind of an extension of maybe the Bennett thing in terms of getting back to her roots in a way and stripping things back a little bit and saying, okay, we need to kind of focus on the songs. Let's not focus as much on the spectacle. I mean, I think it's no accident that kind of the, um, overarching kind of fashion iconography of that was a cowboy hat and, you know, kind of just jean shorts and a t-shirt. Like it was a very, it was much simpler. It was kind of a little bit more down to earth for her. 
and she was kind of exploring family. You know, she was going through some health issues at the time as well. And so she was kind of, you know, figuring out who she was and kind of like recentering herself and recalibrating herself, you know, working with Mark Ronson and, Mark, and having collaborators like Florence Welch and, you know, just having some just really kind of you know, interesting peers and just kind of, you know, getting back to music that was a little bit more almost singer songwritery in a way. Um, but also just, you know, but Josh Hom from uh, Queens of the Stone Age was on there too. And so it's a really kind of, it's a record that kind of also like the, the Tony Bennett collaboration shows that, you know, she can do many things that even though she does like fashion and can be this over the top persona, you know, she, that, that persona has many different sort of facets. It's not just one um, one thing. That album was inspired by her aunt, if I'm if I'm correct. Could you tell us more about that relationship and what that relationship meant to her? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, so, so first off, um, Gaga's name is also middle name is also Joanne, um, but her her aunt's death, and so her aunt died in 1974 at just age 19, so long before Gaga was even born. Um, but it just really uh, it really affected her family, and so part of the reason, like writing some of these songs, was also to kind of honor her memory and also kind of you know help try to heal some of her family because it was very, very moving for them. Um, but she also credits her aunt for helping her overcome addiction problems, which is very interesting. Um, you know, and just in terms of her being able to, um, you know, she was almost a kind of like a spirit guide almost in a sense, or, you know, someone who, you know, she kind of viewed as someone, um, who is sort of an angel or, or guide or, or something like that from, you know, the great beyond to kind of help steer her in, in a good direction. And, um, but yeah, and it was, uh, you know, the, in her documentary, there's so many moving moments involving her aunt and her family in terms of, you know, showing her family so the songs that she had written and things like that. And so, you know, it was a, also a way for her to kind of get back to her roots in terms of, you know, because family has always been so important to her. And so she was also kind of remembering that aspect of herself as well. So it definitely was sort of her kind of you know, getting back to and trying to find, you know, a new center exactly, you know, being sort of this huge, huge superstar, and then also figuring out how her true self kind of fits in, in, in that universe. Going to such a personal place on Joanne was incredibly difficult for Gaga, as you write in your book. But at this time, she's blossoming in a whole other artistic medium as an actor. And most notably in 2018, she stars in the remake of A Star is Born, and she has some musical contributions to that. Do you see a connection in how she took her experiences as a musician and channeled them as an actor? So in some ways, yes. And, you know, having seen the movie, like she was phenomenal in it. Like she was just really you know, a lot of times when musicians are acting, you're like, oh, it's basically a thinly veiled, you know, version of them. Like, you know, you know, it's them. And she really disappeared into her character. Um, but at the same time, she was able to sort of bring that whole um, arc of, you know, she had never kind of lost that hunger in terms of I want to be a success. I'm ambitious and I need to figure out who I want to be and what do I want to become. And so in that sense, she was really able to kind of bring that to the role because they really needed that sort of that optimism and that ambition, um, you know, and also that sort of, um, you know, comfort on stage. So in, it's like she was the perfect person to play that because she was able to sort of bring that to the role. But she also didn't necessarily make it 100% herself. You know, she she didn't try to make it over the top. She didn't try to be too flamboyant. You know, she really tried to be true to the character. And, um, you know, who is, you know, has this very, um, you know, up and down relationship with Bradley Cooper, basically the the you know, his, his character in the movie. And so she really, um, she brought, brought a lot of nuance to that. And she brought a lot of sort of um, restraint to that as well. And so, you know, it was a very human sort of performance. And I think that's why people gravitated toward it because, you know, she really, um, you know, she really understood the character intimately and, you know, wasn't trying to be Gaga as that character. She was really, she really kind of became that character. Much of the difficulties Gaga dealt with were related to her experiences with trauma and her personal journey to transcend that. And you detail some of that trauma in your book. And her 2020 album, Chromatica, saw a return to more familiar dance pop aesthetics that we know of, of Gaga, but with disco and new wave throwbacks. 
One of Chromatica's most poignant themes is the realization that you can move on from that trauma. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. And, you know, and this was, this record is so good. It came out right as the pandemic was starting, like two months after. And so it was one of those records that in some ways it was so well-timed because of the themes you mentioned, but on the other hand, it didn't necessarily get the attention that it deserved um, just because it was sort of a a record you wanted to play in clubs and go out with other people. And we weren't doing that at the same time, at the time. Um, but it is. It's she was very, you know, honest about a lot of the issues in terms of having, in terms of you know medication, in terms of uh, you know uh, dealing with um, you know mental health issues, and dealing with like what that's all sort of looks like, and you know how she's able to sort of you know cope with those things. And so it was very, very honest. I mean, that's not necessarily usually the stuff of like dance pop or dance floor, you know, uh, material. But the way she kind of cloaked it is as sort of optimism and it's sort of like, I'm going to overcome this and this is something that I'm dealing with and it doesn't define me. I'm going to, you know, triumph over it. That made that really, really good for the dance floor. Um, And it's just really, I I think it's her most cohesive record in terms of music wise, because it is kind of disco influenced and new wave and just really, really also still very poppy as is her way. Um, But I love it. It's, it's obviously, it's one of my favorite Gaga records for sure. It's a record where I hear a lot of that Bowie influence because she was such a huge Bowie fan. And Aladdin Sane just had its 50th anniversary recently, I think last week. And that's an album that also like at its heart has those themes of just kind of overcoming trauma, Bowie in his in his brother, in his mental health issues. And I, I kind of see the little bit of those connections there and how she continues to, you know, have those influences. I can absolutely see that. And, you know, you mentioned, you know, Bowie, because she is such a huge Bowie fan. Bowie also kind of toyed with fame and looking at, you know, what does fame look like? And, um, you know, what does it mean to get rid of fame and using personas to as a way as kind of a conduit to talk about celebrity as well before we really had, you know, uh, knowledge and, you know, before celebrity was such a huge, huge, huge thing in pop culture. And so you really see that like with both of them. And I really love that parallel between Chromatica and Aladdin Sane because, you know, I think there is a lot of it and it's very subtle. You know, I think over the years, early on Gaga was, you know, much more open about kind of the Bowie influence. And over the years, she's really incorporated it in, um, you know, a lot more kind of nuanced ways. And that's made her music um, a lot richer as well. You write in your book that while Gaga evolved throughout her career, the resilience she displayed very early on blossomed into something more enduring, which you say consists of a steely resolve of personal strength and emotional generosity. With that in mind, where do you see Gaga going as an artist? I mean, you know, I've, I've been asked this a few times and it's so interesting because you just never know, you know, she put out another record with Tony Bennett, which I, you know, I wasn't necessarily expecting because, you know, he is navigating Alzheimer's disease, um, at the moment and is, I think is mostly retired basically from the stage now. Um, so that was sort of unexpected, but she could go anywhere. And I think that's kind of the beauty of it. You know, right now, she you know, she's filming right now. So she's kind of focused on acting a little bit, you know, her music. I mean, she could put out a folk record. She could put out a, you know, another full on sort of disco throwback record. She could kind of do just a kind of a straight up dance record. She could do a rock record. You know, she could do a piano ballads record, you know, and, and any of those choices, you know, would, would fit her persona and her personality and her, in her, in her skills. And any of them would make perfect sense sense within her career, just because she is someone that really keeps people on her toes or their toes. And, you know, just is really, you know, is, is following her muse wherever the muse takes her. And I think that's, what's also so admirable. She's never afraid to kind of, you know, rip up, a, a, you know, her persona from a different era and try something new. And so I think that's, what's so exciting is that who knows where else she'll go next. And so that's, that's kind of, you know, that's one of the reasons why she's such an amazing artist. Um, and also just so exciting. So the book is really cool looking and it has all these incredibly gorgeous photos in it. I have to know, how much fun was it going through those? So it's so, the coolest thing about this book is that 
I didn't have actually anything to do with the photos until I saw the book. So my publisher you took care of like picking out photos and finding the best ones. And they're so good at that. And so I, I, when I got the book, like I was, that was like the first time I was able to kind of see it up close. And so I was blown away because, you know, having seen Gaga before and obviously read so much about her and, and read, you know, and seen so many photos of her, you know, I'm very familiar with, you know, her different guises and things like that, but just seeing it all put together. Oh, it was unbelievable. You know, it's just, it's just such a pleasure. She's just visually, she's just so inspiring, um, no matter what she's doing. So those photos highlight Gaga's fashion throughout her career. And you have little mini essays about some of those, uh, some of those fashion outfits, uh, like the meat dress, for example, I, I primarily know you as a music writer. So how was it for you to write about Gaga's fashion? That's a good question. Um, uh, you know, I I, I kind of treated the fashion era a little bit like other articles I've done in terms of I did a lot of research and I said, okay, you know, I've, I, I was able to see the meat dress several years ago at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So I was like, okay, you know, I had a vision of it. So I was like, what, you know, I kind of basically how I approach music is I always come from a place of curiosity in terms of like, let's help figure this out. Let's try to figure out what this means, what context goes into it. So like, for example, with that one, I did the exact same thing. You know, I did as much research as I could looking up. How did it, how did that idea even come together to do a meat dress? How did they, who, who sewed that? You know, what did they do afterward? How were they able to preserve it? And so I basically came into it with a lot of questions and I kind of did some research to find out, um, you know, what exactly happened. And I was able to kind of put that together then. Um, but that was, you know, but, and, and the Met Gala, um, you know, I, I am never fashionable enough to be at the Met Gala, but I, every year I love looking at the fashions from the Met Gala. And so I knew that something like that, especially I had to, you know, write about that as well. And so it was just a matter of trying to figure out her most iconic eras and her most iconic outfits, and then just kind of, you know, trying to describe them as best as I could for people. I think the meat dress was 2009, and I saw in 2011 at the Rockwell Hall of Fame a part of this Women of Rock exhibit. And for listeners, it's a it was a jerky dress at that point. So uh, if you're curious of how they managed to display that, they cured it. It just looked like you know, just jerky. Yeah, it was. It was. Oh, you know, I, I'm not a vegetarian, but if you were, if you are, uh, if you are not a meat eater, it's, it's definitely up close, not something uh, that's very appetizing. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so closing out this interview, I want to know, having gone through her whole discography for the book, what are some of your favorite Lady Gaga songs? Oh, man, I, you know, I know I mentioned telephone before. That's absolutely like, I think that's one of my, I, for whatever reason, I just love that song. I think I love everything about it from the beat and the groove to the, you know, the lyrics. So that's awesome. Um, I, you know, the fame monster EP, I know I mentioned that I absolutely love that entire EP. You know, it's, uh, there's so many songs on there. I like it from dance in the dark to teeth. Like it's so much fun. Um, let me actually, I, let me look up that because I'm like, I can never, Oh yeah. So, Dance in the Dark, like I said, Telephone, Teeth, like that's just, uh, you know, that's kind of like my jam because it's so new wave. Um, I also really like on Chromatica, I like, you know, obviously I, I like the little interludes that are sort of named after the um, the record. But Alice, oh my God, Alice is such a great song. And then, you know, Free Woman, those are two of my favorites too. Art Pop is something that really grew on me. I, you know, back when it was released, I wrote a negative review of it and I regret it to this day. Um, but Venus, I love, you know, and, um, art pop too, just kind of, and, you know, there's so many songs on that record too. That's also kind of moved up to one of my favorites now too. And so I was like, all right, you know, famous last words and you have to do kind of a quick turnaround review and, you know, it doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, live up to everything. Um, but yeah, those are just some of them. I mean, I, I am such a fan of her entire career. You know, it depends on the day. Some days, you know, different songs, you know, I like more than others. So as this is an academic podcast, some of our listeners may not be familiar with Gaga. Where would you recommend a new listener begin? You know, that's a good question. Um, if you're a new listener, I would almost start off with the fame, um, just because that is sort of, uh, you know, first off, as a debut record, it's really strong, but it really has a lot of kind of the mission statements 
of kind of her entire career and really kind of sets the stage for a lot of the places where she went next. Um, and then I would I would listen to Chromatica and just kind of get a sense of where she is now, um, just because it is such a, like we talked about, such a rich record, kind of a dense record. And, um, you know, there's a lot to unpack in those two things. And you can kind of compare and contrast too, just in terms of, you know, how her thinking has evolved on fame and celebrity and and mental health and things like that. Well, Annie, this is was a lot of. I'm going to say that. Um, well, Annie, this was a lot of fun. Your book is so cool, and it's an amazing tribute to an indelible pop icon. And I cannot stress this enough. It is a very gorgeous looking book, and I really appreciate you for taking the time to join me today. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. My name is Bradley Morgan, and you've been listening to New Books and Music with my guest today, Annie Zaleski. Her latest book is Lady Gaga: Applause, and is published by Palazzo Editions.